The book of Judges, Judges chapter 6, if you want to be turning there, Judges chapter 6. The uh, new copy of the spiritual sword is out. Can we save our children is the theme of this issue. And uh, the elders are wanting to pass them out in Bible classes, so we're going to spend just a couple of minutes here. They're going to be coming around. And... Uh, encourage you to take these home, read them. Uh, you know, you might put them uh, at the kitchen table in the morning when you're reading your newspaper, pick one up, read an article or two uh, as you go through it. Uh, some very good articles in here uh, about faithfulness, about uh, the church, about uh, uh, saving our children. And of course, uh, when we th- talk about one of the issues in the church uh, in, in any religion, we see it across the board, but in the church too, uh, that the, the younger generation is not as faithful. It seems that they're starting to, to well, not starting to, but they had, that's been a problem since the beginning of the church, is that uh, uh, the next generation doesn't as adhere as much. And so uh, a, timely, a timely subject, can we save our children? Can we keep them faithful? And so we encourage you to, to take them, they're free, uh, and then when you finish with it, by all means, finish with it. If you want to keep it, that's fine. But if not, uh, pass it on to a friend, someone else who might appreciate some of the same things. And uh, uh, Spiritual Sword's been a, you know, it has uh, started, you know, Spiritual Sword has been around since 1958. It's not the oldest publication in the church, but uh, uh, it has certainly uh, established itself as one of the best. Uh, uh, Brother Alan Hires is the editor uh, who is a, a judge out in Tennessee, and uh, he's, uh, each year he speaks at Polishing the Pulpit, and it's always a joy to get to hear him. Uh, last year, I remember he did a lesson on Amos, a country boy from Tekoa, and it was a great lesson on just the, the, the book of Amos. And so, uh, wonderful man and uh, some good articles here. Also, uh, might mention that uh, later uh, this week, uh, our sister uh, Gertrude Walker is going to be turning 103, and uh, we're going to have some cards here in just a little bit going around, and uh, I ask you to sign those cards, uh, and uh, we're going to get them to her this week so that she'll be inundated with love from the, the church here at West Hill, and I think the, uh, uh, we're going to try to get some kids to go over and visit with her as well. Uh, sometime this week. So uh, as that card comes around, it's not here yet, but uh, uh, as it slips in the door and it's passed to you, you'll know what it is. It's a card for uh, Sister Walker, and uh, just sign it and pass it on. I think we'll probably have two in here, so you only need to sign one, but uh, I figure with as many people in here, we may need two cards to, to hold all the signatures. Gideon. Uh, I got scolded this week for turning my Bible inside out. I'm going to try not to do that. (laughs) Gideon, one of the great judges of the Old Testament system. In fact, when we go back and we look at Gideon, it's a a lesson of God gives the victory. You know, sometimes we we really think that it is is our power and our prowess, our wisdom and, and our skill and ability that brings us the greatest amount of victory. And yet, what Gideon teaches us is that God always gives us the victory. When we are victorious, whether it is the field of battle, or it is a victory over self, or victory, maybe we're on a, a, you know, something as simple as a diet plan. When God gives us victory in those moments, we understand it is a blessing from Him and not just me under my own strength and willpower. After Deborah, there were 40 years of rest for the land. We find in in Judges 6, verse 1, that rest and God's providence and protection are always conditional. Conditional. We talk about unconditional love. 
You know, the love we might have for our children is unconditional. What do we mean by that? We love them even when they're not lovable. Absolutely. Uh, We love them despite their actions or their attitudes. Uh, Sometimes we may not like what they're doing to themselves. We may not like the road that they're on, but we still love our children unconditionally. They do not have to prove themselves over and over to us for our love to be extended to them. Yes, we might have some disappointment and we might have pride for our children. But our love for them is not dependent upon those conditions. God's love for mankind is also unconditional in that God loved the whole world that He gave His only begotten Son. There are no conditions upon the love of God for mankind. He created us as the pinnacle and the jewel of the creation. You remember, he, he makes all the things of the creation. And he says, it's good, it's good, it's good. But then he made man and he said, what? It's very good. Man was exalted to a higher position. Man is a special creature in, in the eyes of God. And he loves him. You know, sometimes we, we get this, this picture of God in our minds that he's, he's not a forgiving God, he's an unforgiving God. That he is waiting for us to make a mistake or a misstep. And that God is, is just waiting to pounce on us like a, a lion from the bush. But that's not God at all, is it? God is, God is constantly showing and demonstrating his love. I love Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God commends His own love toward us. Some translations, God demonstrates His own love toward us. The idea is that God's love is so open and so visible. It is unmistakably love. Well, how? And that Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. God's love is unconditional. But, God's protection and God's salvation is conditional. Now, does that mean that we we earn God's salvation or we earn the salvation we get? No. What is the difference then between earning it and conditions? Okay. That's not the way it is. God does not owe you for even if we did everything possible, if we did everything right, and 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 uh, uh, we 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 forgave others, and we were kind, and we helped those who were poor, and we we strove to live righteously. When we sin, we receive the wages of what? Death. That's what we rightly deserve. But no amount of good works erases the debt of sin. So it's not that we earn the salvation. But that doesn't mean it is unconditional. It is conditional. Notice Judges 6 and verse 1. The people of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand uh, of the Midians for seven years. What happened? Well, the last verse of chapter 5, the land had rest for 40 years, and then what happened? Israel did what was evil. You see, after 40 years of rest, while they were meeting the conditions of God, then they did what was evil. They stopped meeting those conditions, and God withdrew his protection. He allowed them to be oppressed by the Midianites. In fact, uh, even at the end of Gideon's life, we see much the same thing, that as long as they are faithful, God is protecting them. But when they turn their backs on God, God removes the blessings. It's not that, that God uh, is uh, uh, 
wanting them to fail or that God is, is pushing them in, into failure. It's simply that God removes the blessing of his protection. You know, the Midianites, they're already standing at the door, chomping at the bit to get in, aren't they? All of their enemies, they're, they're wanting to devour Israel. God is simply keeping them at bay as long as they follow him. But when they reject God, when they forget God, God eventually has to withhold that uh, 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 blessing. Paul says in Romans chapter 2, Do you not understand that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? The good things, the blessings which God gives you should lead you to repentance. What if they don't? What, what other means does God have if we don't recognize his blessings in our lives? Huh? Okay. We, we get our justice. We, you know, if, if God's blessings don't lead us to repentance, then God says, okay, if the blessings don't do it, maybe withholding the blessings will. Isn't that what happened in, in Amos? I withheld these blessings and you didn't return. I withheld a few more and you still didn't return. So I, I withheld even more. You know, God, God has so much at his disposal and he uses them all trying to get us to come to him. But his, his blessings upon us are conditional and we have to understand those. When Gideon is confronted later in, in, in verses 11 and following by the angel of the Lord... He is beating out the wheat, in verse 11, in a wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Um, <laughs> significant thing here, uh, when you think about the wine press, the wine press was a, was a symbol of prosperity and joy. Uh, they're not in prosperity and joy. They're in, under oppression, right? And so instead of you know, beating out the wheat on the threshing floor, which is where the Midianites would expect the wheat to be, they're hiding it in the wine press because they don't have prosperity. The wine press was going unused, so let's hide it there. They're trying to save the nation from the oppression of the Midianites. And the angel says to him, uh, mighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. And Gideon said, please, sir, if the Lord is with us, remember for seven years they've seen that the Lord was not with him. If the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hands of the Midianites. It's interesting. Seven years, 40 years of rest. Now seven years have gone by. How, how short-sighted we often are. That just seven short years compared to 40 years of rest has caused them to think that God is dead. God is gone. God is not here anymore. Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, where are all His mighty works? But how did they know about the mighty works? What did He say? That our... Father has told us about. How important is it from one generation to tell the next generation of the greatness of God? Highly important. This is, this is how we keep the Word of God and the Gospel ever present. Uh, uh, looking at the, the, this issue of the, of the spiritual sword even. Can we save our children? Yes. The answer to saving our children the answer to saving the next generation, the answer to keeping them from leaving or getting them back if they've gone astray, it's one thing, the Word of God. That's it. Now, it's our obligation as this generation to teach the next generation the Word of God. And if we forget, if we fall down on the job, if we allow other things to become more pressing to us than imparting the greatness of God to the next generation, what's going to happen to that generation? They're going to be lost. 
their connection to God and their connection to the church will be very weak. It will be pulled tight. And if it gets pulled just a little bit more, it can break. Gideon understood this. He says, look, our fathers have recounted unto us the greatness of God. How come we're not seeing that anymore? Well, it could be. Even in our current age, the reason why we're not seeing it is we're not meeting the conditions of faithfulness that God has set forth for us. And so he calls Gideon and he tells Gideon, you are the man of God. Gideon says, I, 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 I'm going to test you. I want to see if what you're saying is true. Uh, uh, if I found favor in your eyes, in verse 17, show me a sign that it is you who speaks to me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And so the first sign that he says is, that, you know, I want to see if you're the real deal. Stay here while I go prepare a meal. And so Gideon goes and he prepares the meal and he brings it back and gives it to God. And it says in that place, in verse 24, that Gideon built an altar there after he's fed the angel of the Lord. And he calls the place Jehovah Shalom, or the Lord is peace. To this day, it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abiezrites. That night, the Lord said to Gideon, verse 25, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old. His father's bull and the second bull, it was very common well, in fact, this is how they, they trained their animals. The, the, uh, uh, you would have one experienced ox on the plow or on the cart, and you would couple it with an inexperienced one. And the idea was that the older one would show the younger one how to respond to commands, how to pull the plow or how to pull the, the, uh, the cart when they were in the yoke together. And so he says, take... First, your father's bull, which would be the new bull, the new one, and also the, the second bull that is seven years old, showing that he has experience. But I think there's another significance to the seven years old. What's been happening for seven years? They've been oppressed. This bull has not lived at a time in which there was rest in the land of, of, of Israel. So you take this working team and he's going to ask him to sacrifice it. What happens when you sacrifice a working team? How much work do you get out of them? <laughs> you lose all the work that they could do, don't you? It's gone. When, when it was a sacrifice, it wasn't just a, a sacrifice here of what they were, you know, oh, we lost a, we lost a cow out of the, the herd or something like this. This was their working bull. This is how they made their living. This is how they plowed their field. This was a huge sacrifice. And he tells him, you, you take the seven-year-old bull, you pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah, which is beside it. Some translations say the grove. These were um, most likely a, a grove of totems. You think of totem poles. That would be carved in the image of the god Asherah. Hence the, the term. Uh, you take those idols which surround this pagan altar. And you tear down the altar. You tear down the Asherah. You build your own altar to God. He doesn't want you to use an old altar that was used for a pagan god and then now sacrificed to, to the true and living God. You tear down the old one, you build a brand new altar, and you sacrifice on it this bull of seven years, the experienced bull, the bull that represents seven years of oppression. You sacrifice that to God, and you burn it on the wood of the Asherah that you've cut down, the groves. The symbolism is, it just reeks here that, that the, the, uh, uh, the impotent, weak gods of the Asherah and the pagans, the Baal, uh, are being, being consumed by the true and living God. Even the, the work 
which comes to Israel during a time of oppression is being sacrificed to God. We are starting new and afresh. You know, when we come to God today in, in humble submission to the gospel, we sacrifice our old ways. There's a statement made by Jude when he says when we come to God, we hate even the garments that are spotted by the flesh. What does he mean by that? To hate the garments that are spotted by the flesh. Okay, the sin which we commit... Uh, and, and I think that's the idea of the flesh or the spotting of the flesh is the sins which we commit. And, and he's saying, look, when you give up the old life, you give up all those things, even to the point of hating the garments that are spotted by the flesh, the clothes. Does that mean we have to get a whole new wardrobe when we obey the gospel? Not necessarily. But if there was that one shirt, you know, that lucky shirt, you always went out dancing in that shirt, you know. Oh, the ladies like that shirt. And you have a special place in the back of your closet for it. What does that mean? It means you still have a tie to the old world. To the old self. I don't want to get rid of the shirt. Man, that was, a, that was a lucky shirt. Now, the rest of your clothes, you're like, well, you know, that's what I wore to work. Okay, you can still wear that to work. Fine. But if there is a link to the past, even in your clothing, get rid of it. If obeying the gospel puts you at odds with the work which you do, get another job. The work which Gideon and Joash would do on the farm with their oxen, he says, we're getting rid of that work. And, and he does so, that uh, uh, he, he sacrifices the animals, he builds the altar, he tears down the other one, he cuts down the groves, and it says at the, the end of that paragraph that he did it when? At night. Why? Because he's afraid of his family. Who built the altar? His dad, right? Pull down the altar, verse 25, of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah. His father's a leading man, at least, in the region of the Abiezrites. He has this, this altar, but it says, because he was too afraid of his family and of the men of the town to do it in the day, he did it by night, in verse 27. I'm going to do what God has commanded me to do. But sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard today. Sometimes we we seek to follow God even under the cover of night or obscurity today. But if we've truly changed, even if we have obeyed in obscurity, if our lives are truly changed, it will show, won't it? When the people of the town wake up the next morning, they go to sacrifice to Baal, the, the, the altar is torn down. And who has done this? Who dare tear down our altar to our God, Baal? Who dare step in and try to take this worship away from us? And they figure it out. It's Gideon. How do you suppose they knew it was Gideon? Yeah, his his life is changing. You know, he's he's you know given this sacrifice to the uh, uh, to the angel of the Lord that spoke to him. He's built a new altar himself in the daytime uh, and called it Jehovah Shalom, peace with God. Uh, His life is changing. You know, when we obey the gospel, when we become Christians, our lives change. And we may think, well, you know, I'll keep the same friends. And, and some of those friends will, be, will continue to be friends. But isn't it true 
that the deeper we fall in love with God, the more those old ties begin to sever if they're not going with us. And, and Gideon is changing. And they saw it. And they're ready to kill him. And Joash, his father, steps in. And he says, wait a minute. Why, why are we going to do Baal's work? If Baal is a deity. If Baal is God, let him take care of Gideon. Let him do the work of killing Gideon. Let him contend. In fact, they started calling him Jeroboam, which means let Baal contend. Let, let him do his own dirty work. Which is interesting because how did Gideon think his father would react? Well, yeah, he thought he would. He was afraid of his dad. He's afraid of his family. And he says that he's also afraid of the men of the town, and, and maybe that was rightly so. But his father stands up for him. His father stands in the gap between the men who seek his life and, 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 and Gideon. Have you ever been afraid for your Christianity or for your faith? You thought, well, if, 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 if I showed this side of my faith, people wouldn't like me anymore. Or, you know, if, if you know, maybe, maybe this happened to you at one time, you know, if, I, if I'm on the baseball team and I don't go to the game because it's, it's time for services on Wednesday night, people won't like me anymore. If I go to my boss who keeps scheduling me on Sundays and I say, look, I, I want off on Sundays, he's going to be angry with me if I get off on Sundays. And a lot of times we build up this this fear, this anxiety about what others will think of my faith if I truly let it show. That's kind of what's going on with Gideon, isn't it? He's afraid of his family, his father, because he's tearing down this altar. And yet, when it came right down to it, his faith, or his, his fear, was somewhat unjustified, wasn't it? You know, I think a lot of times we build up in our minds that anxiety and that fear when in reality it's not that big a deal. I don't want to talk, about, talk to my coworkers about the gospel because they may not like me anymore. Or they'll look at me funny at work or maybe you know, the boss will come down hard on me. And so we, we're afraid to let our light shine in those places. And we build up this, this terror... And then lo and behold, it, 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 it's not a big deal. Yeah, Julie? When you were talking about getting involved, that's probably exactly what you were talking about when you were talking about unconditional love. Yeah. Yeah. Still his son. <laughs> you know, uh, he is, Gideon is still Joash's son, and so he still loves him and is willing to put himself. I mean, he's putting himself in jeopardy. I mean, these are people that want to kill Gideon. Uh, and because of his faithlessness for Baal, and, and now Joash steps in and sides with Gideon. He's putting his own reputation on the line against Baal. I think sometimes we need to be careful that we don't amplify a possible fear and let that hold us back like Gideon didn't go in the daytime. He did it at night. And we've come to find out the fear was, was unjustified. So he's now called Jerob Baal. The, uh, the rest of the, the Midianites and uh, the uh, uh, other uh, enemies of God, they, they come in and they camp in Jezreel. In verse 33, uh, the Spirit of the Lord clothes Gideon and sounded the trumpet, and the Abiezrites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they, were, they, they sent messengers to Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali, and, and they, they all met Gideon in, in the valley. And so Gideon then seeks a sign. 
And the first sign is, I will leave this woolen fleece out overnight. When we come back, let there be dew and moisture on the fleece, but not on the grass. God gives him the sign, and it's just as he had said. And then he comes to his senses and he realizes, well, of course there's going to be water in the dew or in the wool because it retains water naturally more than the grass will. Tomorrow morning, let it be the opposite. Let the fleece be dry and the grass be wet. And he came out and it was that way. Gideon seeks a sign. Why is God not angry with Gideon for seeking a sign? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 and 39, this generation seeks for a sign, but they will not get it. Again, in chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, Matthew 16, 1 through 4, this generation seeks a sign, and they will not get it. Why Why do you suppose God is not angry with Gideon for seeking a sign? That, that's a good point, Dan. I hadn't really thought of that. Uh, the, the idea of this isn't a sign, I don't know if you heard him, this is not a sign of Gideon say, saying, God, show me who you are. It's more like Gideon saying, God, show me who I am. You know, that I'm, I'm the one that you want. That's a good point. I like that. Yes. I, I think that the difference is that Gideon is asking in faith. It's not that he's doubting God and saying, okay, I don't believe you unless you show me a sign. He's asking in faith. He believes God is able to do exactly what God... He just wants to make sure this, this is really God's will. Uh, the difference, you go back and you look in, in Matthew in chapter 12 and chapter 16... He calls them not just this generation. He says this wicked and adulterous generation. They're seeking a a sign out of faithlessness. But Gideon is seeking a sign out of faith. There are people who come to the Word of God and they're looking in faithlessness. They're wicked and, and adulterous people and they're trying to find the gotchas against God in the Bible. And they always think that they find them. Uh, big controversy over the last couple of weeks in, in, in national policy was the idea that, that uh, uh, well, you know, the, the Muslim terrorism is just like the old Christian terrorism. Because God told Christians there in numbers to go and annihilate entire villages and all the people in them, Right? Those weren't Christians, but it's in the Bible, Nancy. There there is a a distinction that people are not willing to make and not willing to find because they are looking in faithlessness. They're looking for the gotcha. They're not looking for the truth. But when we in faith look for the truth, we will find it. It is here for us. And... That's what Gideon is looking for. He's looking for a sign from God in faith, not faithlessness. In chapter 7, beginning in verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel boast over me, saying, Mine own hand has saved me. God wants everyone to know that he has given victory. Now, This doesn't just mean he wants the Israelites to know. He also wants the Midianites to know. He wants the other nations that are watching the conflict between Israel and Midian to know that Jehovah reigns, that Jehovah gives the victory. And so he whittles down the army. There are those uh, that, that are... there's. To begin with, 32,000 that have answered the muster of, uh, of Gideon. 22,000 
He says, if you're afraid, go home. <laughs> I may not have been afraid, but yeah, I'm afraid. <laughs> 22,000 get to go home because they're afraid. Of course, fear, fear um, spreads like a cancer among the troops. One person who is afraid, who begins talking about his fear, can convince his neighbor there is a reason to be afraid. And then the next one and the next one until an entire army or an entire unit will refuse to go into battle because they're too afraid to die. Fear will cause us to lose the battle. I was reading a book a while back. It was Not War But Murder was the title of the book. It was... It was about a civil war battle, and it was, uh, uh, in fact, it was uh, the 1863 Battle of Cold Harbor, and uh, the, the rebel forces were dug in the earthen works, and the battle itself was so lopsided, somewhere around 20,000 casualties on the Union side versus around 3,000 on, uh, on the Confederate side. The Union forces were pushed back, and they talked about how at night the, uh, you know, they they wanted to they wanted to put or go in into the battlefield and pull the the living, the wounded off the field, but they were afraid because there was no truce. When they finally did, after the battle's all over, and they go in. It, it was an it was unreal how many muskets on the battlefield were not just still loaded, but were loaded with two and three and four and five muskets. Because as the, as the soldiers would raise their musket, they were too afraid to fire. That they had convinced themselves that they shot, and they'd pull the rifle down and they'd load it again. And they would raise it up and convince themselves that they'd shot again. And they'd pull it back down and they would load it again. I believe it was around 80% of the muskets on the field that were recovered were loaded more than once. Fear. God says, I did not give you a spirit of fear. I didn't, I didn't bring you out of the world to be my soldiers, to enlist in the great spiritual battle for the souls of mankind and give you a spirit of fear and timidity. But I gave you a spirit of boldness. I'm afraid too many of us have accepted the spirit of fear. God said to Gideon's army, if you're afraid, go home. Fear does not do me good. How many are left? 10,000. 10,000. Now, we won't find out until the next chapter how many Midianites there are, but I'll give you a preview. There's 135,000 enemy troops. 135,000 enemy troops. 10,000 with Gideon. And God looks at it and he says, still too many. So he gives this, this order, have them go drink. Those that kneel down and take their time and rest and sip water, send them home. Those who, who draw the water up and lap like a dog and get on the road again, take those. And how many are left now? 300. There's no possible human way in which 300 can defeat 135,000 troops. And so God has, has, has made it where when victory comes, they will know where victory comes from. There will be no doubt that God has given them the victory. 
So that same night, chapter 7, verse 9, the Lord said to him, Arise and go against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you don't believe me, you take your servant and, and you sneak into the camp, you and your servant, and I will give you a sign. Notice, this is what now, four signs that God has given to Gideon. Why would he give him so many signs? Well, with each one, we see Gideon's faith increasing and increasing and increasing. Each time, he's becoming stronger and more the man of God that he needs to be. And in this case, it was uh, that, that he's going to overhear two of the soldiers of the Midianites. One has had a dream, and he tells him about uh, you know, uh, you know, the biscuit rolling in to the, to the camp, and it hits a tent and turns it upside down and flattens it out. And the other one says, because I know when I interpret dreams, this is the first thing that comes to my mind, a biscuit killing a tent. Surely this is the sword of Gideon. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how the, the, uh, they, they come together, but uh, obviously it is God giving the interpretation to this man. Interesting how God uses the enemies, his own enemies, to bring about his will. God does this several times throughout the Old Testament, doesn't he? He uses those who are enemies of God and turns their intentions into something good. Uh, the witch of Endor, for example. She was a necromancer, right? She, was, she would call the dead up. And when Saul went to the witch of Endor, how many, how many dead people do you think she actually communicated with in her lifetime up to that point? None. <laughs> That's why she is as surprised as anyone else when Samuel comes back. God allowed in that moment her evil deeds to bring forth his message. The old prophet from uh, 1 Kings 13 who, who hears the young prophet that has come from the south that has condemned Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, changed his hand to stone and then back again. The old prophet, who probably had never received a vision or a word from God in his life, lies to the young man. God said, come and eat at my house. And the young man said, God told me not to, not to eat here, to go straight home. Oh, but God said, come to my house. It'll be fine. So he believes him and goes and he eats at the old man's house. And in that moment, God uses that man, the old prophet, to tell the young man, you should have listened to what I told you and not to what some man told you. God used Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, it refers to him as my servant. Did Nebuchadnezzar believe in Jehovah? No. Why, why would he... Why was he so intent to punish Israel? Because he was the king of Babylon. He was the king of Babylon and wanted to destroy Israel. God used those evil intentions to bring about his will. So it has been. God uses evil people like this, uh, this man, to say, Gideon is the son of, the son of Joash, a man of, of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. In verse 14, and it works. Gideon's uh, uh, faith is bolstered, and I find this interesting in verse 15. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he what? He worshipped. He worshipped God. And I think sometimes we get into the habit of thinking, well, Sunday's coming, I can wait till then to worship. Sometimes things happen in our lives that deserve immediate worship and praise toward God. It can't wait until Sunday. Think about that first child that was born. And in those moments when you held that child, were you not immediately thanking God and praising Him for the gift He has just given as you held that child in your hand? Think about the time when, when you thought there was too much month at the end of the money and you're wondering, where am I going to get the money to pay for this water bill? 
and God comes through, do you not immediately thank God? Of course we do. Prayers, thanksgiving, those are good things. But it doesn't just have to be prayer. It can be songs and praise and adoration. God, you are great. You know, we can say those phrases outside of the Sunday worship. When, when Gideon hears this dream and this interpretation, he immediately worships God because God deserved the praise and the glory and the adoration. One, one more lesson I, I think is important that we, that we uh, uh, look from, from Gideon or from, from the life of Gideon. We're not going to get into chapter 8 much, but uh, not only does God whittle the company or the army down to 300, but when it actually comes time to fight the battle, notice verse 20 of chapter 7. Then the three companies, there's a hundred in each company, the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. So you can just imagine that if you're at night, you're the 135,000, you think everything's going well, and then you hear the breaking of 300 jars and the blowing of 300 trumpets. You would naturally assume that with each trumpet, there's a whole cadre of forces <laughs> aligned with them. And the breaking of the jars, you know, you wouldn't think that that was just 300 jars, 300 torches, 300 trumpets, and 300 men. You would think that this would be a great army, and it terrified them. But it says, it says that when they blew the, the, the trumpets and broke the jars, they held in their left hands the torches, and they held in their right hands the trumpets to blow. Where did they hold their swords? If I've got a trumpet in one hand, I'll hold the trumpet this way, and I've got a torch in the other hand, how am I holding a sword? I'm not. God was so powerful and is so powerful that He brings victory through the unconventional ways. He doesn't rely, He didn't even have to rely on their prowess and skill with a sword. There's nothing about a trumpet and there's nothing about the torch that should bring victory. There's everything about God that brings us victory. You know, there are people who look today to, to earn their salvation through some great mighty work, through some convention that they have added, through, through some means of men, and God says, don't do it your way. Just do it my way. It wasn't just about not having weapons. It was about... Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the 